Thank you. May be seated. Well, at this stage and here in 2 Timothy, we find the raging animosity of the nation of Rome against the church. And in the Roman Empire, the church was heavily persecuted and it finally caught up to the Apostle Paul and caused him to be arrested as he was, of course, the leading spokesman at this time for the Christian faith. He had been taken back to Rome and placed in prison. And he is there because of a furious wave of persecution. The leading Christians have been arrested. We know many of them have already been executed at this time. And we know that Paul is next. And as we come to 2 Timothy, that's the scene in which we find the Apostle Paul sitting in the dungeon. His liberty that he had had once he was in kind of a house prison had now ended. And now due to the difficult incarceration, that dungeon, he sets out to write the last letter he ever wrote that is recorded in the scriptures for us. If you will, 2 Timothy is the last will and testament of the Apostle Paul. So out of all the characters that we've studied in the scriptures so far in our study of what it means to be the church, he writes to Timothy, why of all the churches, of all the things he could have written to and for, he chooses to write to Timothy. Let's look at some verses here in 2 Timothy to see Paul's heart. Look at verse number 16. The Lord give, in chapter 1, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Anisiphorus, for he hath oft refreshed me, and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. Look at chapter 2 and verse number 9. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Look at chapter 4 and verse number 6. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Look at chapter 4, verse 16. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Look at chapter 4, verse number 11. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable for me, for the ministry. Look at chapter 1, and verse number 15. This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia, Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. So I want you to look at, this is where he is. What sadness toward the end of Paul's life. At some time, only Luke is with him. Uh, we have Onesiphorus who was looking for him. But he says, ultimately, he is alone. You would think that at this time of Paul's ministry that he would be having accolades and embraced by all the people that, 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 that he has loved and that he has turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. And instead, Paul, here at the end of his life, is alone in prison in the company of criminals and no one's around. Notice how many times Paul says in this short letter how he longs to see Timothy. Look at chapter 1 and verse number 4. Greatly desiring to see thee. Look at chapter 4 and verse number 9. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Look at verse 11. Take Mark and bring him with thee. Look at verse number 21. Do thy diligence to come before winter. Look at chapter 4 verse number 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. He's longing to see Timothy again because he knows that Timothy is going to be the key to carry on the work that the Apostle Paul has laid the foundation for. So what he's doing here in 2 Timothy, I believe, is passing the torch, passing the baton, giving his mantle, as in the Old Testament, Samuel, as it were. Uh, he at this particular time, or I should say Elijah, at, at this particular time is in his upper 60s, maybe 66, 67, pushing 70. And having spent his life, he's now ready to be offered up to the Lord, having accomplished ultimately all that God had, had wanted him to do. So... Timothy at this time is probably in his upper 30s. And he carries the brunt of the responsibility for ministry and extending the kingdom of God to the next generation. Paul says that Timothy is his child in the faith, his protege, his student, his disciple. And Timothy faces tough times. Timothy is facing persecution and hostility. 
and animosity and resentment, resistance even in his own church. And it will not be easy. Notice what, how many times Paul speaks of this. Look at verse number seven of chapter one. For God had not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. This is what Timothy's having to deal with. Look at verse number 13. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Look at chapter 2 and verse number 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Look at verse number 22. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace. Look at uh, verse number 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. Look at verse 25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Look at uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Know this also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. Look at verse 11. Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Look at Luke verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Look at verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom. Preach the word. Look at verse number 5. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. You see why he's writing to Timothy? Chapter 2, verse number 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So the reason why Paul is writing to Timothy is because Timothy is facing much of the same things that Paul had to face. And maybe according to verse number 4 of chapter 1 that we just read, Paul was mindful of Timothy's tears. He says in verse 7, God hath not given us the spirit of fear. So it tells me that at this time in Timothy's life, he's struggling. He's struggling. He's struggling. Think of this. God had laid upon him the tremendous burden that needed to have a successor and carry on the work. Frankly, let me say this. Few works survive the death of the man that begins that work. But the Christian ministry does because Jesus is the one that started the church. So how did Timothy get to the point in his life where Paul could trust him out of everybody to be his successor? Well, I believe the answer came from the foundation before Paul ever got into Timothy's life. And that is the ministry of his mother, his mother Eunice, a godly mother who gave the proper foundation upon which Paul could build. Now, there are many children and teenagers today who come to church with their parents. But do those parents provide the kind of example needed to keep them serving the Lord in the church when they become adults? Eunice's choice made a significant impact in the life of Timothy and ultimately the life of the church. And I believe through her example, we're going to see how, just, how we can encourage our children to serve the Lord after they're out from under our authority. So let's look at it today. You're quiet. You're not going to like it. I didn't like it. I'm a parent. I'm talking to myself. Would you understand that when I stand in the pulpit, I am not like other preachers. When I preach, I'm preaching to myself first. I'm not coming up with a condemnation or judgmental message toward you. This is speaking to my heart. And there's a lot of ways that I can be a better father. So let's look. How can we encourage our children to serve the Lord? Notice I didn't say, how can you encourage your children? How can we encourage our children to serve the Lord? Number one, with authenticity. With authenticity. Be real. I want you to notice here in the text in 2 Timothy chapter 1 that as Paul's life drew to a close, he realized in a deeper way how, how much Timothy really meant to him, how dear he was. Paul's own circumstances were difficult, yet he was greatly encouraged. He was the Lord's apostle. Notice Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. He understood where he was and why he was in prison was ultimately the will of the Lord. 
Isn't that good? He was Christ's apostle. He knew God was going to take care of him no matter where he was, no matter what he was doing. And whatever happened to him was in the hands of the Lord. And I venture to say that ever since he got a glimpse of the third heaven when he was stoned outside Iconium, don't you know that when he said, I render to Caesar, I want to go to Caesar, Paul knew exactly what he was doing. Notice what he had. Verse number one, here he is in prison. He's about to be offered to the emperor Nero, but notice, according to the promise of life. Isn't that good? So you see, he knew he was about to be beheaded here, but there was a promise of life to come. Isn't that wonderful? Here's why. Look at verse number 10 of 2 Timothy chapter 1. Now, but now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. No wonder Paul can extend to Timothy here with all that he's going through. Notice, grace, mercy, and peace. By the way, I looked at that, that phrase because we see it all the time in Paul's writings. He always says grace and peace. I, I think it's striking that Paul always adds mercy when his greetings are to pastors. Grace, mercy, and peace. You know why? Because Paul knew preachers needed mercy. Paul prayed for Timothy. Look at verse number three. I thank God, whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. Paul knew Timothy's weaknesses and problems. And he was able to pray definitively and, and with a real burden on his heart. His praying was not just routine. Well, Lord, just be with Timothy. No, the Bible says that he was mindful of what Timothy was going through in his life. That's what we talked about last week. A lot of us are so focused on the fact that we're stuck in prison, right? But Paul is saying, I'm mindful of thy tears. He's not saying, well, I'll tell you what, Timothy, it might be bad for you, but let me give you some real problems. Won't you be in prison with me in Rome? No, no, no. The Bible says Paul was focused on bearing the burdens of Timothy. Isn't that something? You imagine if we have a church filled with people who were mindful of the tears of others, what kind of church we would be? So notice, he says this, and I want to explain this a little bit. In verse number three, I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience. Now, I'm not assuming at all, we should not assume that Paul is trying to defend his evil actions before he comes to Christ. He said, I've always served from my forefathers with a pure conscience. That's not what he's saying. We understand and know that before Paul came to Christ, he was a murderer. He was a persecutor of the church and ultimately to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you understand and know that when you come out against the church, you come out against the Lord Jesus Christ because the church is the Lord's body. Well, if we were mindful of that, we'd watch what we say about the church. Oh, you didn't like that. But he was forcing people to blaspheme and deny Christ. He agreed and participated in the murder of Stephen. Paul had known God from his earliest years, years according to Philippians chapter 3, verse number 5. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. His ancestors had given him the Jewish faith. But understand what's happening here. He's serving God now, with a pure conscience, the Lord had forgiven him of all that he had done before. And so he's serving God with a pure conscience. Paul had confidence in Timothy, and here's why. Because of his background. Look at verse 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and in thy mother Eunice, I am persuaded that in thee... Also, if the Lord were to look at the faith of your child today, would that faith be what they learned from you first or would it be in spite of your testimony? This is what we're finding here. It's always a great blessing and a delight to be entrusted in the lives of young men as Paul was and, and to be giving them the opportunity uh, to, to help them be discipled in the truth. If we think of over and over in the scripture, Moses left all in faith when he was one third as old as his final age. 
23 years old, God began to use Moses and work on him. Uh, Joseph, as a young man, about 17, endured in all hope. Daniel triumphed uh, over all through prayer as a young man in the palace of, of Babylon. Uh, Rebecca left all in love. Esther, a young lady, risked everything for others. David, as a young, ruddy man, was, was willing to fight against the enemies of God. That's why, listen to me, it is a blessing and an encouragement when we have young men that are willing to step up and minister in God's house. I'm thankful for the young men that are willing to take a stand here. You know what Paul said? Paul said to Timothy, let no man despise thy youth. That's what the Bible says. I'm thankful today that when I first started the ministry, I was fresh out of Bible college. I was a 21-year-old little whippersnapper. And yes, there were many that despised my youth. But then there were others that were just thankful I was here. See, that's the difference. Paul didn't think that Timothy's tears were evidence of failure. Being mindful of thy tears. But that he was struggling. And he was honest. Lois, Timothy's grandmother, and Timothy's mother, Eunice, was saved. And the Bible says they had an unfeigned faith. You know what unfeigned means in the Bible? It means real. It means genuine. To feign something is to fake it. Over there in, in 1 Samuel 21, 13, I never want to give you a Bible definition without using the Bible. And he changed his behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands. You remember that when we studied the, the life of David? He was acting, he was faking like he was a madman. And he scrabbled on the doors of the gate and let, let his spittle fall down upon his beard. He was fearful. He was faking. Psalm 17 and verse number one says, Hear the right, O Lord, attend unto my cry. Give ear unto my prayer that goeth not out of feigned lips. Don't let my prayer life be fake. It's genuine. Jeremiah 3.10 says this, And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah had not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly, saith the Lord. It's not genuine. It's false. The reason why Timothy was going to be a leader in the church and the reason why he was going to ultimately be used for God in a mighty way was that he witnessed the unfeigned faith of his mother and his grandmother. Paul knew Timothy's mother, Eunice, knew her grandma, his grandmother, Lois, were a living example of genuine Christianity. And that same faith was in Timothy because of their life, their example. Notice that Lois was not perfect. Notice that Eunice was not perfect, but they were genuine. They were real. I'm going to tell you today, if we want our children to serve the Lord after they leave out from under our nest, listen to me, we will show them authentic Christianity. Authentic. I didn't say perfect. Because if you try to act like you're sinless in front of them, you're no greater than a Pharisee. Don't be a hypocrite. You know, one of the worst things that you can find, I can't tell you how many times, 17 years as a youth pastor and after that, here the pastor, very involved in my teen's life, I can't tell you how many times in my office, my teenager, a teenager would come in and say to me, listen, my mama, my daddy is not like they appear. They're here one way and they're out there a whole nother way. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. And then we're not to be legalists, not only hypocrites, but not legalists, following a bunch of rules without developing a relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ to love. See, if we love him, if you'll develop the relationship with Jesus on their own, a lot of those rules that you have set up will naturally take place anyway. See, Pharisees tried to make everybody think that they were perfect and to not show any flaws. Jesus said, you're like whited sepulchers that appear real beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of dead man's bones. Isn't that something? My challenge is unfeigned. Be real. Don't worry if your children see your scars. Don't worry if, if they see that you're not perfect. Don't be afraid to say, I'm sorry. 
you see. Your kids need to see a genuine Christianity. Genuine. They need to see somebody that's trying to live their life for Christ even when they don't get it right all the time. Authentic. How can we encourage our children to serve the Lord with authenticity? Well, if you didn't like that one, you're not going to like the next one. God, talk. Amen. You got to be happy that you come to church where the Bible's preached. Yes. And your ears aren't tickled. Yes. It'd be a lot easier to tickle your ears. But then I wouldn't be doing what God's called us to do as well. How can we encourage, listen, if you don't, I've got, I've got a dozen people that watch these sermons every week. <laughs> if, if that, bless God. How can we encourage our children to serve the Lord with authenticity? Secondly, with action. With action. Why don't we do something for the Lord? I want you to notice here in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas, let's go to Acts 16. Paul and Silas first come to Derby and then to Lystra in the reverse order of the first missionary journey. And, and if you'll remember, we've talked about this in weeks past that Paul would establish churches. Then he would come back around on the next missionary journey to establish them in the truth, to, to help them be rooted and grounded in the faith by teaching them the truths of God's Word. And so we find the fruit of the witnesses of these believers in these churches. And the Bible says that these churches began to increase daily. You see, it's a great product of testimony. And as we grow spiritually, a natural result is to grow numerically. As you draw closer to the Lord, you'll want the world to know the same Lord that you know. And you'll invite them to church on a regular basis. That's what we're talking about this year. I don't care that we're still in the midst of COVID. I don't care how many different variants we're going to get. People still need the truth of the gospel. They still need church. So, Timothy, the Bible says, he, in verse number one, then came he to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman. Well, 2 Timothy tells us who that certain woman was. That was Eunice. Eunice. And the best thing that probably happened here in Derby and Lystra was the enlistment of Timotheus or Timothy to take the place of John Mark, who at that time had abandoned the work. Timothy was probably converted the first time because he was Timothy's, uh, Paul's son in the faith. And so he was probably converted the first time that he visited Lystra. In 1 Corinthians 4, 17, Paul calls Timothy, my beloved son. See, it's, a lot of, it's an amazing thing. Parents, tell, all the time when I was in youth ministry, I'm their mama, I'm their dad. We're not trying to replace you. Right? But when we are, are building their spiritual life, they are like our sons and daughters in the faith. And by the way, we love and care for them as much as if they were our own children. I mean, I can't speak on behalf of every youth pastor, but I can speak on behalf of this one. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 1 and 2 that Paul called Timothy my own son in the faith. And so look at what happens here. This young man, Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish and believed, but his father was a Greek, verse 2 of chapter 16, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him with Paul had to go forth with him and took and circumcised him. Uh, let me just put it this way. Timothy wasn't eight days old at this time. Are y'all with me? Can I say that without having to get into graphic detail about how awful what was taking place here in this verse was? But his mother Eunice allowed it for testimony's sake. Unbelievable. Eunice allowed Paul to have Timothy circumcised. Here's why. Look over in Acts chapter 15. You'd say, well now wait a minute. That goes completely against what the early church said about circumcision. Look at chapter 15 and verse number 23. 
And they wrote letters by them after this manner, the apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren, which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Sicilia. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying, ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Remember we said, as the gospel was going to the Jew and the Greek, there was some confusion as to how much of the law belonged under the dispensation of the grace of God. And so this transition from Jew to Greek, the apostles were working these things out in the early church when you still had churches that had Jews in them. And this is what was required, verse number 29, that you abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if you, you keep yourselves, you shall do well, fare thee well. And you see in the early church, these are the commands, and it had nothing to do to circumcision. But here's an important spiritual principle that Paul understood. Paul knew that Timotheus, Timothy, was going to be ministering to both Jews and Greeks. He was half Jew and half Greek. Paul, for example, did not allow Titus to be circumcised. Look over in Galatians chapter 2, verse number 3. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, he was full-blooded Grecian, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they may bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Titus was not to be circumcised so that the enemy would not think that their cause was being promoted, that you ought to mix law and grace. The battle in Jerusalem was over the truth of the gospel. And so Paul's concern with Timothy was not his salvation. His circumcision had nothing to do with his salvation. But with his testimony to the Jews. That's what we're talking about here. Timothy would be working both with Jews and Gentiles in the churches. And so it was essential that he not offend them. That's why Paul had Timothy circumcised. Look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Look at verse number 19. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. And to them that are under the law is under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law as without law. Not being without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I may gain them which are without law. To the weak I became as a weak, and I, I might gain the weak. I, made all, I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake. So when we allow Scripture to define Scripture for us, Paul said, Titus, don't you get circumcised because it will make the enemy think they've won. Timothy, you get circumcised because you're going to minister to both Jews and Greeks, and Jews will not listen to you unless you're circumcised. That, my friends, is the liberty which we have in Christ that ye serve one another. Isn't that good? Now, I don't think you'll understand. You need to listen to this again a little bit later to understand the depth of what our liberty in Christ means. And it certainly doesn't mean to live however we please and sin as much as we want. It is a wise spiritual leader who knows how and when to stand for the truth and when to apply the word of God at which situation. And that's what Paul did. So in the years that followed, Timothy played an important part in the expansion and strengthening of the churches. The Bible says that he traveled with Paul over and over again as the ambassador in all of those troubled spots in those churches that had both Jews and Greeks. You see how important this is? He became pastor of the church at Ephesus that had Jews and Greeks. And he joined Paul in Rome shortly, I believe, before he was martyred in 2 Timothy. So what's the point? Dietrich Bonhoeffer 
the missionary said this, not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. Eunice encouraged her son to do the work of the Lord. I want you to hear me very clearly. Academia is important. Athletic reward is great. But both of those things pale in comparison to the eternal rewards of having children serve Jesus Christ with their life. Eunice encouraged Timothy to submit to the man of God. You realize today that there are many children and teenagers who don't respect the man of God because of what they hear at home. Any problems I ever had with teenagers were either one of two things. It was either because their parents didn't come to church at all or their parents came to church and dogged out the man of God and the church of God when they were at home. He said, is that true? I lived it. You can't tell me it wasn't true. So think of this. Eunice encouraged Timothy even to the point where she knew it would cause Timothy some physical anguish like circumcision. She gave her son to Paul. You know what that reminded me of? That reminded me of 1 Samuel chapter 1. And all that was, that was going on in Hannah's life. And Hannah was not able to have children with Elimelech. And she went to the temple to pray, didn't she? And, and she asked for a son. And the Bible says that God gave her what she asked for. And you know what she did? She gave her son back to God. That's what she did. The Bible says, Oh, my Lord, as my soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here, praying, praying unto the Lord. Verse number 27. For this child I prayed... And the Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him. I love verse 28. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. He's yours, Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Eunice reminds me a lot of Hannah. When I think about her and this decision, he's right there in her hometown and, and she sends him forward knowing that he is about to be circumcised and allowing it anyway. Why? Because he's the Lord's. She is the epitome with Hannah of what the Bible says about our children, which says over there in the book of Psalms, you know it, in, in chapter uh, 127, verse 3, Lo, children are an heritage not of you, but of the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. It is our responsibility to, to, to value the heritage of God to the point where we're willing to teach them how to serve God with our actions. It wasn't just an unfeigned faith that, that Eunice and Lois had. They, they put it into action. They sent Timothy forth for the good of the work of the Lord. All those other things that you allow your child to spend all their time with, hey, they're, they're, they're important, they mean something, but at best they are temporary. At best. Service the Lord, they're going to have to answer for the time that they spend in this life before the Lord Jesus Christ and the things done in their body, whether it be good or bad. And I'm here to tell you that, that all of those accolades that they got, they will rust, they will wither, and they will fade away. I got out the other day, I have a, a, a box of, of trophies and plaques and, a, and awards from over the years from academia and... and not really sports, but uh, I didn't get any rewards from them. I did letter, though. I did letter. But you know, it's an amazing thing. After just some time, it's never been exposed to the elements, never been exposed to water. I opened some of that stuff up, and, and now it's, it's not as shiny. Now it's rubbing away. It's, who cares? You know, there's nobody that I meet and says, listen, I was just wondering, how well did you do in football? That would be a very short conversation. You know, I think about the prospect uh, uh, th this past week of, of, of what people are calling the greatest quarterback that ever played the game. He's about to retire. And boy, he has all these accolades. He's won more Super Bowls. He's been to more Super Bowls than anybody can ever. But what about his soul? I think about him. And I think about all of these, how they, let me tell you, this is, this is idolatry. People worship athletes today. They worship them. 
But all that is for naught when He, just like you and me, will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. How can we encourage our children to serve the Lord with authenticity, with action, and finally today with authority? We must instill in them where the authority of their life comes from. And it's, it's in one place. Look at 2 Timothy. Look at chapter 3 and verse number 14. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 14. This is Paul talking to his son in the faith, Timothy. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Well, who did he learn them from? Look at verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be truly furnished, or may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. I want you to think of this. From a child, thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. Well, well who did he learn it from? It wasn't Paul. It was from his mother and his grandmother. It was from 2 Timothy chapter 1. From Lois and Eunice. Now you say, well, wait a minute, what do you mean the Holy Scriptures? Well, the Bible defines what we're talking about. Look over in, in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 2. What did they have? Which he hath promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. You know they had? They had the Old Testament. Isn't that good? They had the Old Testament. That's the all Scripture that he's talking about. What Eunice had was given by inspiration of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration. That from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. Now you know what I find fascinating about it? Do you really think that Eunice, who was, who was married to a Greek, had the original writings of Isaiah and Jeremiah and David and Moses? No. Sure didn't. She had copies. Just like you and I do. The word Scripture is never defined in the Bible as the original autographs. Never. We find, for example, over there in, in Luke chapter 4, that when Jesus was preaching his first sermon in his public ministry in Nazareth, wasn't even Jerusalem, in Nazareth, can any good thing come out of Nazareth is what they said about that town. And in the synagogue, there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. So he opens up the book of Isaiah. And notice what he says about this copy of the book of Isaiah in a synagogue in Nazareth. Look on down verse 21. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. He defined the copy in the Jewish synagogue of Nazareth as scripture. Do you realize today that the Ethiopian eunuch was also reading out of the book of Isaiah in Acts chapter 8? And in verse number 28, it was returning and sitting upon his chair, read Isaiah the prophet. So you telling me that an Ethiopian, an African, listen to me, eunuch, goes by Nazareth and asks, hey, listen, can I uh, borrow your original copy of Isaiah? Sure, here you go. That would never happen. So he has a copy of the book of Isaiah. And notice how it's defined. Look on down to verse number 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same, what is that? Scripture. So we have two copies of the same book of Isaiah and both of them are called Scripture. The point. All Scripture, copies included, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Isn't that wonderful? Timothy knew the Holy Scriptures as a child. How did he gain his understanding? Job 32, 8 tells us, But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Spiritual understanding only comes by the inspiration of God. As in the case with Timothy, knowledge and wisdom come by way of the Scriptures. Copies. Copies. Of course, just like you and I have. 
So the inspiration of God produced the scripture. In turn, this same act of inspiration continues to work through the scriptures to produce wisdom and allow man to understand the word of God today. So 2 Timothy states that all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and is profitable for instruction. That's Look at it. all scripture is given and is profitable. That's present tense. That's not was given by inspiration. It is given today. If all scripture is profitable, how could it mean was given by inspiration? Isn't that something? Dean Burgo said this. Do you mean to say then, I shall be asked, that you maintain the theory of verbal inspiration. I answer, I refuse to accept any theory whatsoever, but I believe that the Bible is the word of God. And I believe that God's word must be absolutely infallible. I shall therefore believe the Bible to be absolutely infallible until I am convinced of the contrary. Theories of inspiration as they are called are the growth of an unbelieving age. That's the truth. Timothy had been taught the words of God from the time he was a child by his mother and his grandmother. He said, just continue in the things you've already learned. As an adult, that's what it says. That from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. But verse 14 says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. You'll never outgrow the word of God. You'll never not need the Bible. Matter of fact, I venture to say that adults need guidance in the Scriptures more than children do. Because you see, adults have to face adult temptations and have to make adult decisions. Parents should teach their children to submit to the authority of Scripture. That's where the authority is. The Bible is the end all. There's so many verses that we could go to. Psalm 119 and verse number 128 says this, Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. That's how we need to start. The Bible is right. Everybody else that says something contrary to the Bible is wrong. Notice, I hate every false way. If it contradicts the scripture, it is a false way. You ought to hate it. It's not true. Look at what one, uh, Psalm 118, 161 says. Princes have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart standeth in awe of thy word. Those children that God has given you the responsibility for, and grandchildren, I mean, you see Lois right here as well. They need to see you be in awe of the scriptures. And then Psalm 138, verse number two, you say, well, is the Bible really that important? Well, let's ask God. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou, talking to God, hast magnified thy word above all thy name. So I would say that the Bible is pretty important to God. He magnified his word above his own name. And so that's what we're supposed to do. He tells Timothy, you just continue doing the things that you've been taught from a child. You have these church members, Eunice and Lois. Your children should see you read it. They should see you study it. They should hear you read it. They should see you go to the place where it is exalted as often as possible. You want to know why? You want to know why you feel like your kids don't have any respect for you? Right? Because you've put the wrong authority in their life. You put the authority as you. Authority is not you. The authority is God. And the authority is His Word. When they see you study His Word, you know what's going to happen as a natural result? They'll respect their, your authority. That's how that works. They'll submit to you as you submit to God. Right? So many men, I'm the man of the house. I don't understand why these women don't serve me. Well, first of all, that's not what submission is. Second of all, 
You submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. I know y'all don't like the verse before that. And then, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. Right? Because the authority, you want the authority to be you. Authority is not you. It's the Bible. If the authority is the Bible, then they'll submit to you like they're supposed to. You know, that's why I don't spend a whole lot of time preaching on standards. I don't preach a lot of, uh, on, on things like dress attire and, and women plating their hair, amen, how, how short their skirt is. First of all, let me tell you something. A man of God shouldn't be talking about those things anyway. You know what he should be doing? Preaching the scriptures. And when, when people willingly submit to the authority of scripture, then all of those standards tend to work out for themselves anyway. See, it's not that I'm, I'm afraid to preach on these standards. It's that the wealth of Scripture compels me to preach the depths of the unsearchable riches of Christ. And as someone begins to develop and mature in their faith, all of those silly little things that hurts their testimony, they'll just naturally want to get rid of because they don't want to do anything to offend their Savior. See how that works? That's why... When they get out from under your authority, they'll go back to the most worldly standards that you can imagine. Because it was all about preaching standards instead of relationship to that book. Okay, well, you didn't like any of that. But I think about Eunice. The power of the scripture is only demonstrated in the lives of those who claim to believe it. And so I ask you, are you an an influencer. I feel like that Eunice was an influencer. Are you an influencer today like Eunice? Does your life give a vivid picture of what it means to live for Jesus with authenticity, with action, and with authority? I hope that it is. Heavenly Father, whew, Lord, that was...